Back him up. Know what these clowns are up to? What seemed like a simple traffic violation in a one-way street. Hey boys, uh, what's going on? Was an encounter that would be critical in securing the convictions of men whose desperation meant they were capable of anything. Just give me the money out of the till. He wanted out. He's evil. I just put my life in shit. That car was driven in a dangerous fashion. He was found hiding in bushland about five or ten metres from the road. I don't know nothing about the robbery, the shooting, the police. He was aggressive. He, he didn't want to be there. He had a hatred for police. There was no doubt about that. robberies on small businesses have become such commonplace, they rarely make it to the evening news. But one string of robberies got everyone's attention, not just because of its similarities, but the escalation of violence that went with it. Police knew they had to act fast before the results became deadly. As I was driving up the road in pursuit after this uh, blue forward laser, I came to an intersection. The Blue Ford layers are slowed up dramatically to about 10 to 20 kilometres an hour. I thought this was strange in the middle of a pursuit, and it was at that point that I noticed a passenger lean out of the window with a sawn off rifle. I then accelerated as harsh as I could to get behind the offending vehicle out of the line of sight. The fact that they've shot towards us and aimed directly at police, their intent wasn't just to scare us, their intent was to hit us, kill us, or to stop us by any means. Fortunately, it was a quiet Easter Monday morning where there was very few vehicles and pedestrians on the road at the time. We've continued pursuing after him through a number of local roads. Again, the passengers leant out the window and taken a shot at us. Yeah, uh, the vehicle's fired another shot at us. Shot, copy that. This has angered me personally, you know, threatening my life, so we've continued the pursuit, and that's that point in time where we were terminated by the duty operations inspector at police radio. Terminate, 223, from the door, terminate. 223, copy that. 223. I was patrolling through the Liverpool area when I heard the pursuit come over the police radio. And being in the dog squad, it's a fantastic job for the dogs, obviously, it's a chase of a car, so the offenders run away, the dogs should be there to catch them. Then I saw cars, so keep a lookout for a blue laser sedan. And I believe there's two males on board, was just involved in a pursuit with shots fired. Decided approach with caution. Eventually I found the car, dumped in a side street, and uh, looked to me when I pulled up, nobody was in the car. Yeah, 534 off, so just whisper to Hotel 334. Is that the LA we're looking for? Just the one. This is only 10 minutes. We copy that 534, just for your information, just to appropriate caution, these people are armed and have already fired shots at police. So just opened the driver's door, let the dog have a bit of a sniff in the car, had a look inside just in case they were still in there. Fortunately, there was nobody in there. Then I've gone around to the footpath. When people run along the ground, they leave scent on the ground. Our police dogs are trained to find that and locate it. Good boy, my good boy! The track's gone along the footpath, down through some villas along the driveway. Atta boy. Good dog, my good boy. I was thinking, if they're going to shoot at the cops, what are they going to do to members of the public, you know? So I really wanted to catch them. Atta boy. I get to a fence, and the, uh, the dog indicates and locates a sloppy joe and some gloves. Jump over the fence, the track continues through people's yards, over more fences with the sirens and the helicopter. A lot of people came out into the street, and it can we end up losing the track. Confirmation 223, it's possibly the armed hot of a dirt coming at the same time at the uh, Chip and Norton news agency. It would be right, Radio, because we uh, actually first saw them in half a lane at Chip and Norton. Well, I first noticed the car while I was standing at the front of the shop, and I'd seen two guys in there. They just drove past, thought nothing of it. 
Half a minute later, one of the offenders stormed into the shop, fired a shot without even saying a word, which is a big shock. He yeah, then started demanding money. First couple of seconds, you don't know what to do, but then all those things come back to you, like how to act and make sure you listen to him, all the sensible things to do, and to come out of it alive, yeah. I opened up the till, grabbed the notes out. He asked for the coins, yeah, the fucking coins as well. And just don't do anything drastic, like fucking give me the money. You know, that's all it was all about. You know, just very aggressive. And then he asked for the safe keys. Just had the gun pointed at me at all times, so I couldn't get away with nothing. Passed him the bag, said, all right, get down on your knees. Make sure you don't follow me. If you do, I'll fucking kill you. And then when I heard the door sliding open, Ran down to the front, pressed the alarm bell. Before you know it, the cops were actually there in like two minutes. So, a pretty quick response time, I suppose, around the area, yeah. Initially, the young fella believed the gunman fired upwards towards the ceiling. So, myself and a fellow detective positioned the young fella behind the counter where he was standing and got him to show us where the gunman was standing at that time. When we had a line of sight on it, we saw that directly behind him was a cigarette cabinet. We decided then to follow that line of sight and see if a projectile may have passed closer to the young fellow than what he originally thought. I looked at the cigarette display and I found a, a hole had gone through the plastic display for the cigarettes. And I found a .22 caliber fired cartridge casing next to the cash register. This is good evidence because it can be matched by ballistics to a firearm. Getting these guys off the streets was a matter of urgency, as the likelihood of more robberies occurring was high. The willingness of them to fire upon the police shows that they're fairly desperate. But at this early stage, unfortunately, no one had any idea who these offenders may have been. Shots were fired during a robbery this morning in a suburban news agency. No one was hit, but desperate gang members opened fire on police during their escape. The stolen car was found abandoned in Cabramatta just a kilometre from where police had called off their pursuit. Moments earlier, a highway patrol officer was fired on. Police used pole air and tracker dogs in the search, but tonight the men are still on the run. As a witness had identified the same blue laser leaving the Chipping Norton robbery, police hoped the car would contain some indication of who the offenders were. The driver's external door lock had been tampered with and the ignition barrel had been removed allowing the offenders to start the car and steal it. On the driver's seat, I found a uh, business card for a tattoo parlour. On the floor, I found a Milko wrapper and uh, numerous cigarette butts, which would probably yield good DNA. And the best part was on the uh, passenger's front seat. It was a .22 calibre Remington cartridge. And that was also bagged along with the other items and uh, submitted for analysis. The owner of the vehicle said that she doesn't smoke and that people that she has in the vehicle don't smoke. So obviously the, the cigarette butts became extremely important to us and gave us hope that uh, they may yield something down the track. They're also able to tell us that they don't visit tattoo parlours as such, so we were able to establish that these items were left behind by the offenders. 223 in pursuit of blue Ford laser. It was decided then that we would try and retrace the route that the offenders have taken, especially in light of the police officers having been fired upon, to try and locate any spent casings that may have been ejected from the firearm and may possibly have landed on the roadway. Looking for evidence there is much like looking for a needle in a haystack. But this day I was lucky and located a .22 calibre fired cartridge case. The head stamp was the same manufacturer, of Remington, as that uh, the one I located in the news agents. And uh, it was the same manufacturer as the cartridge that was found in the stolen car. In essence, you've got three scenes matched up by the cartridge or a cartridge case. The sloppy Joe and gloves found near the abandoned car were another potential source of DNA, but without a suspect, they couldn't be linked. Then, only two days later, another news agency was hit. I was working out in the back room, and when the door closes, it makes this noise. And I thought, why is the door closing? And I looked out, and I could see the masked man and the rifle. And I thought to myself, we're in a bit of trouble here. <laughs> My sister was working at the front counter, so I was coming out to protect her as well. 
and I just kept talking to him. And uh, in the end, he got frustrated with me and then just threw a plastic bag at us and said, just give me the money out of the till. He wanted out, so that was a good sign to me. And then I was just watching him as Kerry was filling the bag up. And there just seemed to be a window of opportunity to stop him. I just went for the gun. It did go off, but I thought, oh, it's a toy gun. There's just in a big paper everywhere. When I say paper, it was very fine, like a little snow thing. And I really thought this is a chance to hit him over the head with his own toy gun. But because we were reaching across a counter, he was able to pull away from me. But just before he went, another shot went off. And then when I came back in, my sister was on the ground and she'd been shot. One of the bullets had struck her in the side. She was taken to Westmead Hospital and underwent surgery. The shell casings and a projectile that were recovered from the scene, along with the description of the robber, were all consistent with the chipping Norton holdup. Another similarity was bringing a plastic bag for the takings, which had been left behind in the struggle. It's one thing to go and point a rifle at somebody and, and demand their money, which is, is violent and traumatic in itself. But to let off a couple of shots and one of those bullets actually hitting a woman, we were very concerned about how the violence in this robbery had escalated. Once again, witnesses were able to take the registration number of the fleeing car. A quick check revealed that the Mazda had been stolen from this car park. The fact that the blue laser used in the first robbery had also been stolen from a car park next to a railway station was of immediate interest to a newly formed task force. There was a big problem at that stage that um, there was robberies out of control in the Cameron and Fairfield area. There was probably 50 robberies a week. There was a big drug problem, especially in Cabramatta, and they go hand in hand, so therefore people needed money, so there was a lot of street robberies and soft target robberies. Because the cars were stolen from railway station car parks and they weren't too far from where the robberies took place, it seemed the pattern was emerging that the robber was catching a train to the railway station and stealing a car while Sarah and using the cars in the robberies. Later that night, the Mazda used in the Sefton robbery was found burnt out in a nearby park, only a few kilometres from where the robbery had occurred. The lady had been shot and that had upped the ante in terms of what was occurring. It was making us very concerned that someone was going to be killed. And within a week, the pattern continued. We had a call that there was a robbery at the Fairfield West Cellars. A robber had come in armed with a sawn off firearm and he'd gone past the mill room where they were having lunch. It's a fucking robbery! Give me all your One of the victims thought it was a joke. It's not a fucking joke, Get the fucking money, He was very aggressive, he was swearing at them, and as they were complying with his demands, he actually fired off another shot two sons and a father. Inside the store were extremely scared by the actions of this individual going in and shooting at them. They were complying with his direction. $700 was handed over to this male with a batacliver. He had told us that he made particular note of these piercing blue eyes staring back at him through the balaclava. The fact that someone had gone in and shot straight away made us think that there was the same person involved with the Sefton robbery and the Chip and Norton robbery. What the shopkeeper next door had seen made them think it was also the same accomplice. But apart from the 22 casings, the only new leads they had were the blue eyes and a maroon car. Police were no closer to finding the offenders who had been terrorising Western Sydney. And it appeared they were becoming more desperate as the frequency of the robberies increased. There was a robbery on a mixed business in North Parramatta when a man ran in with a balaclava, shot and firearm again. Hey. A mother and her son were attending the shop at the time. Give me the fucking money. Give he me demanded money and the mother was screaming, take anything, take anything. And as she was doing this, the boy was complying with his demands. His mother tried to drag him out the back of the shop to get away from it, and the robber had fired off a shot. <laughs> the shot went right between mum and the boy and missed them both by just a few centimetres. Mum actually got out the back of the shop and went out the front and saw a maroon car there with a, a woman behind the wheel and she was screaming out, help me, thinking that she may be able to assist her. Help me! <laughs> then she is seen the male with the balaclava running out the store and jump into the same car, into the driver's seat, with the girl jumping into the passenger seat. Master! 
The young fellow then ran out the shop and threw a sticky tape dispenser at the car and hit the car a bit, it took off. And it was the colour of the car that caught the attention of the task force. We knew that a maroon car of that basic description was used in the Fairfield robbery. Therefore, we of the belief that it was one of the same offenders. The only thing different in this robbery that we could pick up was he didn't bring his own plastic bag with him this time. When he demanded money off the young boy, he actually said, use one of your own bags. And on this occasion, there was a woman involved. Whilst we thought that was unusual, the MO of that robbery and the other robberies were so strikingly similar, we're still quite confident it was the same robber. We thought with the woman being involved in this robbery, it could become a Bonnie and Clyde type scenario. Within 48 hours, the Maroon car had been found. But as with the Sefton robbery, it had been set alight. Now, while that wasn't good news for us forensically, we did a download of the CCTV cameras at Yenora Railway Station. We actually found the time the car pulled up at the railway station. We saw a young woman get out of the car. A short time later, that car was burnt, and then we see a man coming up the railway station steps following the woman. It was late at night. There was no other persons on the platform other than these two people. The footage we obtained only showed the back of this man. The girl, though, we could see front on. That footage showed this girl wearing a distinctive Nike jacket. And they were seen later on in the footage meet up together on the platform. We slowed the footage down and circulated those snippets to all police in New South Wales, hoping that someone out there would be able to identify her. While they didn't have a name, it seemed certain she was involved when they learned about a petrol station heist the following night. On this occasion, a girl had gone in asking to break some change. The robber ran in, again with a sawn-off rifle. He brought his own bag with him, demanded money from the console operator, then fired off a shot. This robbery was consistent with all the other robberies, apart from the fact he didn't wear a balaclava this time. He wore a plastic bag over his head. But every other feature was similar. The sawn-off 22 rifle, the fashion in which he demanded the money, and the fact that he actually fired off a shot. Whilst detectives were obtaining a statement from the attendant, it was discovered that the same girl had been at the store about an hour earlier. Hi, mate, would you like to buy a, a car stereo? Oh, this girl had approached him and tried to sell him a stereo. Oh, he refused to buy this car stereo, and she's seen getting into a cream-coloured car with a male person driving the car. We retrieved some security video. And what we saw clearly was the act of the robbery taking place, but more importantly, we got good, clear vision of the woman who came in firstly an hour before and then just prior to the robbery. The vision of the woman and the CCTV footage we took from the Enora Railway was strikingly similar. And most importantly, she was wearing a Nike jacket that was identical to both scenarios. A search of the stolen vehicles list revealed that a cream-coloured Ford Meteor had been stolen from the Cabramatta Bowling Club only an hour before the robbery. Once again, the Cabramatta Bowling Club is in close proximity to a train station, which again fits with all the other cars stolen for all the other robberies. And as with the other robberies, the stolen car was still near the area when they found it. The next morning, one of our high patrol officers saw that car and he started a pursuit, pulled the lights and sirens on, and the car just took off from him. Whilst we were making our way to assist the Fairfield Patrol officer in chasing this car, I had let police radio know that the person inside the car could be hospitally armed with a firearm and that it had been used on other occasions. The pursuit with this car was dangerous. At one stage, almost collided with a pedestrian crossing the road. That car was driven in a madly dangerous and erratic fashion all over the Cabramatta and Lansvale and Liverpool areas. The pursuit went for five, ten minutes. It was driving recklessly and dangerously. At one stage, he was going across on the wrong side of the road. He even tried to uh, cause the highway patrol officer to run to the back of him. At the end of the chase, he then crashed on a major road in Sydney. Get out of the car! Get your hands up and get out of the car! Upon him crashing his car, there was a number of police who were present at the time who had concerns that he would do something. Get out of the car and get your hands up! 
this person remained in the driver's seat and wouldn't move from the car. Because this person was refusing to get out of the car and the situation was getting out of control, I then smashed the front driver's window with a police baton. I requested him to get out of the car. He still refused to get out of the car. I therefore had to physically drag him out through the driver's side window. The man was arrested and taken back to a local police station. He was identified as Stephen Hooper. After a dangerous pursuit through the streets of Western Sydney, Stephen Hooper had been arrested. The prime consideration was trying to link him to the AM Petroleum robbery the night before. He was in a car that was stolen from Cabramatta Bowling Club just before the robbery. The manner in which he drove indicated that he certainly had more to worry about than the stolen car, and the fact that he could have killed someone during that pursuit uh, led us to believe that he was probably involved in not only the AM Petroleum robbery, but the robberies that we've been investigating all over Western Sydney. Detective Malone and I are making inquiries in relation to this stolen Ford Moody or cream-coloured sedan. What can you tell me about that matter? Nothing to say about it. Do you agree that police arrested you today at around 10.45am this morning? I'd say so, yeah. What can you tell me about the circumstances that led to your arrest? I don't wish to say anything about it. OK, fine. He was aggressive, he, he didn't want to be there, he didn't want to talk to us. He was just arrogant. His demeanour towards police was... He had a hatred for police, there was no doubt about that. What can you tell me about this armed um, robbery that occurred last night? I don't wish to answer. Did you commit the armed robbery? I don't wish to answer. Pip was a 32-year-old man who had an extensive criminal history. In the past seven years, he'd only been out of jail for 13 months during that whole period. However, he'd never had a robbery conviction on his record. We asked him questions relating to the Sefton um, robbery and what his movements were. Would you be able to tell me where you were on Monday the 23rd of April? I couldn't tell you because I'm fucking drug fuck. I can't remember what I've done fucking 10 minutes ago for our last fucking three weeks, two weeks, whatever. Stephen Hooper had these strikingly blue eyes. The main thing that came out of the Fairfield West robbery was that the robber had these very, very blue eyes. He was also fairly heavily tattooed. It drew us back to the original offence that happened at Chipping Norton. Give all your fucking money! Located in that car was a tattoo business card. So again, it just provided a further link to us. What is your current address? No fixed address. Okay. Where was the last address that you lived at? Mum's. Right. What's your mother's address? Very importantly, we found that he was living at his mother's house only 50 metres from the AM Petroleum robbery, only about 300 metres from where the car used in the Chipping Norton robbery was dumped, about three or 400 metres from where the car used in the Sefton robbery was dumped. So we were quietly confident we are on the right track. A decision not to interview people in relation to the Chipping Norton news agency robbery was made so that we didn't give away too much of the, um, the game. Are you prepared to participate in an identification parade? No, I don't wish to say anything in relation to any of these fucking things. You know what I mean? As you know, there's no fucking stick-ups or fucking firearms on me record, so why should I be interrogated over Because I've been caught in a car that fucking I didn't even steal or whatever. At that stage, we had two high patrol officers who actually saw the faces of the men involved in the Chipping Norton robbery. However, we were unable to show them a photo of a suspect. The way it works is legislation says we have to actually offer these people an identification parade. So it was rather frustrating that we thought we had at least one of the offenders, but we couldn't show the police officers his face because otherwise it would contaminate all the evidence. Under the provisions of the Forensic Procedures Act, I wish to obtain a buccal swab, which is a swab of your saliva from inside your mouth, mm. which basically, in common terms, is a sample of your DNA. Do you understand that? Mm. I just want to clarify, do you consent to giving the pupil swap? Mm. Just for the record, could you? Yes. Thank you. Hooper's DNA was sent to be compared with the cigarette butts found in the stolen blue laser and the sloppy Joe and gloves found in the nearby laneway. Detectives hoped this would provide a direct link to both the Chipping Norton robbery and the shooting at police during the pursuit that followed. With DNA testing in New South Wales, because of the abundance of, of, of crimes that are now being solved by DNA, it's created a, a workload for the laboratories that 
they just have a, a huge backlog and generally that's prioritised in if it's a murder and down from there. So it did take uh, quite a while for our results to come back from the lab. While they were waiting for those results, the time was right to see if there was a ballistic link between the seven .22 calibre shell casings they had collected. Each firearm will basically leave its own signature on a fired bullet or fired cartridge case. This signature is unique to a specific firearm. By using a comparison microscope, I was able to determine that the size and shape of the firing pin across all seven cartridge cases was the same. I then started looking at the microscopic imperfections, which in very simple terms, it could be described as looking at railway tracks and getting the railway tracks to fit against one another. Based on this then, I was able to determine that the seven fired cartridge cases were fired from one firearm. We needed to locate the gun, that was very important. If we found that gun in an offender's premises or somewhere they frequent on a regular basis, and it, uh, if we were lucky enough to get any DNA or fingerprint material from that, it was a direct link to the robber and the robberies. As part of their strategy, Hooper was only charged at this point with resisting arrest and matters relating to the stolen Ford Meteor. He was found guilty and sentenced to 12 months. Because Hoop was off the streets and we knew where he was, it gave us a little bit of time to try to identify the second offender. After looking at the footage from the Yanoa railway station, we were quite certain we had the same man. The body, physique, even the clothing that he wore was strikingly similar to the man depicted in the CCTV. The photos that had been circulated of the mystery woman, also captured in the CCTV footage, finally paid dividends. She was recognised as a Cherie Atkinson, a local prostitute, who, despite her young age, had an extensive criminal history. Once we'd identified Cherie, we had found out that Cherie had been charged with a robbery matter herself, and part of her bail conditions was to report to a police station on a daily basis. So we thought we could grab her when she came to report on bail, but the nature of the beast it didn't work that way and she failed to report on bail. I therefore placed a warning on the system that we needed to speak to her. The robberies had stopped since Hooper's arrest. However, we had two other persons that we needed to identify and uh, locate. The detectives decided to revisit all the robbery scenes in the hope that some fresh information might move the case forward. When we went back to Chipping Norton News Agents and spoke with the victim, he provided us some information that we didn't actually know about, and that was a fellow had been to a nearby news agency shortly before the robbery. I noticed the car was reversed in the front of the news agency, and I thought it was a bit unusual. And there were two guys sitting in the car, basically with their heads slightly down a bit so that they wouldn't be seen by me, I think. When I came out of the news agent, I walked past this guy. He was walking in, I was walking out. He had his hand down behind his trousers. I got back in my car, waited a few minutes, but nothing happened, and then I had to take off because I had to catch a train to go to work. After seeing the same car featured that night on the news, Alan was convinced that the two men he'd seen were responsible for the hold-up. These two guys, to me, were about five, six, five, seven, Australian, nasty-looking characters, and they wore track suits. They looked like drug addicts, up to no good. Mr Francis informed us that should he be able to see these persons again, he would be able to identify them. And the likelihood that Stephen Hooper was one of them was gathering more momentum. We got the results back from the lab and Stephen Hooper's DNA was found in the finger of a glove and on the sloppy joe that were both found not far from the stolen car that was used in the Chipping Norton robbery. However, we couldn't definitively link the DNA in the sloppy joe and the glove back to the car. So whilst it was a good piece of evidence, it wasn't a definitive piece of evidence. That definitive evidence they were hoping for was the DNA results from the cigarette butts. And while they were consistent with being those of Stephen Hooper, they weren't conclusive enough to rule out belonging to other male relatives. But the detectives did get some good news. Cherie Atkinson had just been arrested for shoplifting. When we put it to Cherie that we were aware of her involvement in the AM Petroleum robbery, she saw the writing on the wall and she knew that she was either going to be uh, implicated in the robbery itself or that she could come over to the forces of good and assist us and she made the, the wise decision and assisted us. Wasn't it bad then? I was spending a thousand dollar habit. 
In fact, you, you didn't did, care did about what they did or where they got the money from, you know. It was just money, it was just drugs holding your arm, tell me. Yeah. Both her and Hooper had a heavy drug habit that was up to $1,000 a day. Hooper would go out and get some money. He would then return and they would go and buy drugs. And this was a daily occurrence. Once she agreed to uh, assist us, she had no problems in confirming that was her depicted in the footage in the A Petroleum robbery. However, what she did say is she was unaware that Stephen was going to commit a robbery. Oh, fuck, are you crazy or something? She wasn't aware that that was going to happen until she saw him running in with the uh, gun and the plastic bag over his head. That's why she ran out the store. I had no idea that he was going to do it. Like, my intention was to sell a CD player. And then I went in there, and he just ran in there, shot the gun, and I was free for my life. So as soon as you fired, you were out of there, are you? Yeah. I didn't know what to do. So I run around and go hide, you know, as I thought, if I run, he'll just chase me, yeah. kill me. We were reasonably sure that Shuri was involved in some way in the, the mixed business robbery at North Parramatta. When we actually put that to her, though, she denied any knowledge of that. No. Don't know anything about that? No. However, the Fairfield robbery sounded familiar and she thought it was her boyfriend, Stephen Hooper. How do you reckon you know that it's Stephen who was involved in this robbery? Well, yeah, I wouldn't be 100% sure, but, yeah, like, it sounds like him, you know what I mean? When we questioned Sheree further, she disclosed to us that she'd seen Hooper with a shortened rifle in the past. We forgot a lot of money or something, like a couple of hundred or something like that. And I so said, how did you get that? And I so said, don't worry, don't worry, and blah, blah, blah. You're getting the shots, to so shut up. So it in a bit, you know? When we looked at the footage at Unora Railway Station, Sheree was quite upfront in that, and she confirmed that that was herself depicted in the CCTV. And this is the steps at you know, railway station. We can only see a back view of this man. Yeah, it's really good, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> been pretty lucky, actually. Yeah. But you can tell me better this, can you? Yeah, see. OK, can, how do you know that? Tattoos. Yeah. She identified the tattoo on the back of Hooper's leg. She pointed that out to us. She also pointed out a tattoo on the neck. She said they dumped the stolen car there and Stephen set it alight and they actually went to meet up with their dealer and buy some cocaine. Sheree was a bit vague when we questioned her in relation to Hooper's friends or accomplices. The only thing she knew was a fellow hanging around who she described as being a skinny guy with, with freckles. She said his name she thought was Daniel and possibly had a surname Adamson. Everything was coming to place but we didn't know who this third person was. All we had was a uh, vague name to go on. Someone who was less vague about his name, though, had just come forward. An informant told us it was a fellow named Dennis Adams and he was bragging about the robbery at Chipping Norton, how he was laughing that they'd fired shots at the police and, and the police car skidded off the road and how he thought it was, was a great joke. Can you tell me any more about his method of actually doing the robbery? No, he didn't discuss nothing else really about it, but like I was saying, he boasted about the police car skidding into the side and all that, but he was on tow, you know what I mean? Like, he, he really, like, he stayed down and he, he, he was driving around a little blue laser at the time. After the informant gave us this information, we became quite excited about the prospect that this may well be our co-offender for the Chipping Norton robbery. Adams was living in Mount Druitt, and the car used in the Chipping Norton robbery was stolen from the Mount Druitt railway station. After the police started pursuing the stolen car in the Chipping Norton robbery, Senior Constable Wilder did a confit of the offender who shot at them. The confit looked a lot like Dennis Adams. However, the informant wasn't able to tell police where they could find him. All of their inquiries and an extensive surveillance operation failed to locate Dennis Adams. And this wasn't the only thing holding back the investigation. Stephen Hooper had just escaped from jail. The task force investigating a string of serial robberies was ready to interview their prime suspect, Stephen Hooper. The only problem was they no longer knew where to find him. He was at Kirkconnell prison camp, low security. He and another prisoner pushed a couple of prison guards over and ran away from the camp. Fortunately, Hooper was quickly recaptured and it was time to face the music. Mr Hooper, as I'll very briefly explain to you, Detective Ban and I are making inquiries in relation to a number of armed robberies. Do you understand that? Can you indicate whether you can understand me or not, please, sir? 
I'll go on. Pete was virtually silent with every allegation we put to him. The only time he responded was when an allegation was put to him that his DNA was located at one of the scenes. The DNA found on both the gloves and the sloppy Joe has been matched. The DNA is the same. It's Stephen Ronald Hooper's DNA. Is there anything you'd like to say about that? I don't want to say shit, mate. Do you wish to take this opportunity to deny anything that's been put to yourself? I've denied everything. Although Hooper wasn't talking to us, he was hoping that we were going to talk to him so he could glean some indication of the strength of the case that we were building against him. Just like we're calling you, Mr Hooper, in relation to a robbery that occurred at 9.30pm at AM Petroleum on the 3rd of May this year, the robbery on the 2nd of May at Webb's Mixed Business, the robbery on the 30th of April at Fairfield West Cellars, and the robbery at Chipping Norton News Agency on the 16th of April. The same weapon was used in each of those robberies. We've identified cartridge cases and projectiles which were found at the scene and also one projectile which was taken from the woman who was shot at the Sefton News Agency robbery. That's five links in relation to that rifle with five robberies. Anything you'd like to say about that? However, despite all their efforts, the weapon was never located. So Detective Bingham wanted to ensure that the evidence they did have was solid. Whilst his DNA and the DNA on the clothing was already linked through a former forensic process, we wanted to get fresh evidence. We'll also be attempting, if we can find a uh, suitably qualified officer, to obtain a forensic procedure At this point, I think Hooper realised the seriousness of the situation and he showed his more dangerous side and decided to explode. Well, you can get fucked because DNA he's already taken, done it, right? DNA you get a charge, well, let's fucking go. DNA taken from fucking you and also DNA shit. taken from the clothing and the gloves yeah. that I showed you. Do you understand that? <laughs> Do you consent to a DNA swap? No, I'm not having it. Because he's already fucking took one off me. The DNA swap that was taken from you at Cabramatta was in relation to that stolen car you were driving. We're just asking you to consent to one taken in relation to these um, robbery matters, which are separate incidents. So you don't consent? We're ready to do the identification of Hooper. We didn't have Adams in our custody, so that was a problem. To strengthen their case against both, a lineup was conducted in the form of a photo board. We then put the photos before Senior Constable Wilber. This person was the actual passenger of the vehicle. On recall at the time of the shooting, he was the one that went out the window. I had a um, clear view of him when our cars were practically next to each other within two metres, that is definitely the driver. He's the driver of the incident referred to on the 16th of April. Yeah, that's correct. We then had Alan Francis come in in a similar situation to Senior Constable Wilber. That was the man, the, the driver that I uh, passed as I was coming out of the news agency, he was going in there. We later showed the photo board containing Dennis Adams to Sheree Atkinson, and Sheree was able to say that Dennis was a fellow hanging around Stephen at that time. So we had a number of eyewitnesses, both police and civilian, who had now made positive identifications of both offenders. I was Nicholas Bingham and Dennis John Adams at Mount Drill Police Station. Eventually, Adams did come under notice, not for an armed robbery, but for a domestic violence incident, and Adams was arrested. At that time, we didn't have any evidence to put him to the other robberies, apart from Chipping Norton. We wanted to talk to you about the robbery at the Chipping Norton News Agents on the 16th of April understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Can you tell us anything in relation to that robbery that I'm talking about? I don't know nothing about it at all, and it's just a bigger shock to me hearing it is what you guys are telling me. We've also been given information that you were the person who fired the shots at the police yeah, after the robbery. Yeah. Would you like to comment on that? I certainly would. I just made the comment. I don't know nothing about the robbery, the shooting, the police. This yeah. person has committed himself a statement and is prepared to give evidence in court. That's fine. Get him in court, that's fine. I don't have a problem with anything. Okay. Nothing at all. Adams was very cocky. He uh, seemed quite confident in himself that we didn't have enough to go with. He challenged us that uh, he never did armed robberies. We've also been given information that Stephen Hooper was the driver of the car that morning. That name, Stephen Hooper, rings a bell from years ago. I don't know the guy personally, but I have heard the name. When we mentioned Hooper, he was quick to admit that he did know him, but tried to distance himself. But 
I can know who some people for years, but whether they're a friend, associate, or the person that walks past and says, you know, every day, that's what I'm learning from. As the DNA results on the clothes didn't directly link Hooper to the blue laser, a further test was conducted for the presence of gunshot residue. When a firearm is discharged, the gunshot residue is airborne and it can land on anything in the near vicinity. So we use a small swab, which is a, a contact adhesive, and any particles of gunshot residue would be picked up by the adhesive tape. Gunshot residue was in fact found on one of the gloves and on the sloppy joe and the type of GSR or gunshot residue could be identified as being consistent with those in the casings found at the crime scenes. Although the passenger was the shooter, the gunshot residue from the firearm has drifted through the vehicle and settled on the clothing of the driver. So this was perhaps the last piece of the puzzle that really secured the convictions against Hooper. So eventually when Hooper did appear in court, he's able to see what witness is about to come in. And when he realised that Cherie was prepared to go ahead and that she had appeared, I think this may have been the clincher and he's decided to plea. He decided to enter a plea of guilty to a number of the robberies in lieu of going to trial on all of the robberies. And that plea was accepted by the Crown and also the victims of the other robberies were quite happy with that as well. Stephen Hooper pled guilty to the armed robberies at Chipping Norton, Sefton and the AM Petroleum and for firing a weapon to avoid apprehension. He was sentenced to 16 years in prison and will be eligible for parole in 2014. Adams eventually went to trial on the count of the armed robbery at Chipping Norton and the subsequent shooting at police. Adams was convicted of that and was subsequently imprisoned for 12 years. Armed robbery is one of the most traumatic offences that could happen to a person. There's not one armed robbery victim that I'm aware of in my 21 years in policing that hasn't been quite severely affected and traumatised by it. What this robbery did to me personally, it had a major impact on my health to the stage where I ultimately was diagnosed as suffering from depression. But it doesn't stop me moving on with my life and I try to eliminate exposure to anything like that. I could never buy another business. I would never do that again. Armed um, robberies can have a deep impact on people and if people are out there committing them, we're going to do everything we can to try and put them behind bars where they belong.